how do I think this began? I think that there was a chemical soup and lots of things collided around and somehow something sparked and organic matter was created. I think there was like something very small in the universe and I think there was an explosion. And I think probably over millions of years, rocks and planets and the universe and multi-universities have probably been created. Uh, from divine creation. So I believe that God created the world, but then when it comes to like actually the process of that, vibes. <laughs> vibes. Hey guys, how are you doing? It's me, Tom Cousins. I make films about the intersection of science, technology and philosophy. Welcome to another journey where we explore one of life's biggest questions. A discussion around DNA is where the film's going to end. That's why I'm outside the Francis Crick Institute. Francis Crick won a Nobel Prize back in 1953 for discovering the structure of DNA. But our journey starts with planets that have conditions that might hypothetically give rise to the existence of DNA. Some of these planets we call exoplanets. I'm using footage from the Arctic, from Svalbard, from Greenland. And it's whilst I was there that I got inspired to make this film. It made me think this is probably what an exoplanet might look like. So let me tell you a story about Gliese 12b, a planet 27 and a half light years away from our solar system. Scientists believe it could actually be more habitable than Earth. Located in the Goldilocks zone, a region not too hot and not too cold, it could sustain liquid water with a good atmosphere, perfect distance from its sun, and a location outside the chaotic core of the galaxy. It seems like a prime spot for life to flourish. Even though its star is cooler and dimmer than our sun, Gliese 12b might still have a breathable Earth-like atmosphere and might even have some familiar landscapes. But let's run a thought experiment. What if we got there and found nothing? Even with all its potential habitable conditions like water or carbon or hydrogen, you name it, the planet is still lifeless. This possibility might tell us something profound, that habitability isn't the only or even the primary consideration for whether life emerges on a planet. What if every planet we visit is dead? The significance of life's origins on our planet is a deeply contested issue. How did we move from a bunch of non-living materials to thinking beings like us? Some scientists talk about abiogenesis, which means life emerged from basic molecules. Others mention panspermia, the idea that life could have been seeded on Earth from somewhere else, and some would say divine creation. So let's look in detail at the building blocks which make life possible. One of the first and most fundamental stages is widely considered to be the existence of liquid water. Many ancient traditions have upheld water as the source of life, and with good reason. Water sustains all living things and provides a metaphorical link to our origins. A river's flow can be traced back to its source, just as we might be searching for our own source of life. So if water was the essential property for life to emerge, playing a key role in theories like abiogenesis and the formation of DNA, then a fundamental question to ask is, where did it come from? Probably like, Birmingham? <laughs> Rocks? <laughs> Most of the creation of all atoms happens in stars, and we know that water comes from hydrogen and oxygen, so all of that's from stars. One theory is that water formed in a dense region of space, known as the interstellar medium, where hydrogen and oxygen atoms combined on dust grains. Other scientists suggest that water molecules may have come from water-rich asteroids and comets crashing into Earth. And then there are theories that suggest 
that water came from the Earth's interior, mm. where volcanic outgassing released water vapour that later condensed into oceans as the planet cooled. What's interesting about theories like these is that most of them suggest that water was present on this planet for a while before we find the first signs of life. So why was the Earth dormant for so long, even with the presence of water? Clearly other factors were required, like the right chemical conditions, a stable climate and the necessary energy sources before life could begin to emerge from this watery foundation. Which raises into question what happened to bring these molecules to life? Theories about the origin of Earth's water are tentative and fluid. And we've got some ideas of how it emerged on Earth. For many though, the most dramatic step in life's emergence is the jump from chemical soup to DNA. DNA is a molecule that carries the genetic instructions for all living things like you and me, Tom Cousins, Tom Cousins. made of two strands forming a double helix, visualized over there by that sculpture. Its sequence of four building blocks codes for everything our bodies need to grow and function, passing from one generation to the next as the blueprint for life. But there's another layer of complexity to this. DNA is a self-replicating molecule containing information, which makes it very different from matter, from mere chemical compounds that undergo reactions. At some point it didn't exist, and at some point it did. This moment marks what many believe happened through abiogenesis, the process where life arose from non-living matter. According to abiogenesis, through complex chemical reactions, simple life forms emerged from basic organic compounds, eventually leading to what we know as LUCA. Somewhere though, during this process, a self-replicating molecule emerged which would ultimately become DNA. In this series of stages slash events, something significant has changed in the history of our planet. This birth of life is a moment that holds a great significance, not just scientifically, but in cultural and religious history. So, let's dive in. Throughout history, many cultures have believed in a singularity, an instant when life began. The ancient Egyptians called it the first occasion, while modern science looks to the primeval seas where the first self-replicating molecules might have formed. The ancient Greeks had two words for time. Kronos is like our definition and sees time as a linear chronological flow. The god Kronos was depicted as destructive, you might say entropic. Kairos, on the other hand, refers to a critical instant in time, a moment of opportunity, action and change. Unlike Kronos, Kairos speaks of birth and permanence. The beginning of life is a Kairos moment, a birth that permanently changed the course of history. The emergence of DNA or life itself aligns more closely with this concept of time as seen in many cultures. In Hinduism, for example, the idea of Brahman, the eternal unchanging reality, gives rise to the cyclical nature of creation, where life is not merely a linear progression, but a profound transformative event. Similarly, in many indigenous cultures, such as the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, the concept of the dreaming emphasizes a timeless moment of creation where life and the world are in a constant state of becoming, not bound by linear progression. These perspectives view the emergence of life not just as a sequence, but as a Kairos moment, an event of transformation that changes reality. So, there was a time when material existence transitioned to something more, a complex system of information encoded in DNA. That's what we're going to look at next. As we've established, DNA is the blueprint for life. Intricate, precise, and packed with a staggering amount of information. And it can tell us an awful lot. DNA, well, I think it's quite interesting. It's like a very um, easy way to encode life. You can look at Isaac here yeah. and put him down into your USB stick of all of his genes in order. Obviously, we can learn things about the body that we haven't known previously and about our 
connections to one another for good and ill. We can dig deeper back into our human history than, that, than has ever been possible before. There's certainly a scientific significance to DNA. It's a self-replicating molecule that stores the instructions for creating everything needed for life. It's the foundation of how all living organisms, from bacteria to humans, function. But the question I want to ask is where does this information come from? DNA structure, which functions in a similar way to a digital code, suggests to many theists as it does to me, that there may be more to its origins than random chance. Francis Collins, former director of the National Institute for Health and the scientist who led the Human Genome Project, found the complexity and order within DNA to be deeply significant. He argued that the information stored in DNA can't be fully explained by material origins alone. Collins writes, the more I examine the universe and the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known we were coming. This insight points to the possibility that DNA, and by extension life itself, might be the result of intention and design, not just random processes. Professor Francis Crick wrote, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. Despite being an atheist, Crick openly describes the origin of life as almost a miracle, acknowledging the incredibly low odds of life beginning on its own. Francis Crick talks about the unlikelihood of the science. Francis Collins talks about the creator behind the unlikelihood. This unlikelihood has led many scientists to seek alternative explanations. As mentioned before, abiogenesis is a process which the scientific consensus, statistically speaking, deems incredibly unlikely. It's also a process we've never actually observed, in a lab or otherwise. This is not to say that abiogenesis did not happen, or in fact to say that the intervention of a creator god and abiogenesis cannot both simultaneously be true. They are not competing explanations. One may answer the how question, the other may answer the why. Another unlikely yet cinematically loaded explanation is the idea of planet seeding or panspermia. In this explanation, life may have emerged elsewhere in the universe and found its way here on comets or asteroids. But this simply pushes the explanation for life's emergence further down the chain. What happened on this other planet where life emerged? What was the root cause? What was the source? Where does the river begin? This wild journey of finding an explanation to life's origins is necessary, I think, because information isn't just matter, it's meaning. Just as musical notes on a page represent a composer's intent, the information in DNA might point to something beyond the material world. As Professor John Lennox states, the human genome is an information-bearing molecule. Just as letters in a specific order form words that carry meaning, so too does the information in DNA create a language, what Francis Collins called the language of God. When Francis Crick unlocked what he called the sequence hypothesis in the late 1950s, he realized that the four subunits along the interior of the DNA are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or digital characters in a section of software. We know from experience that whenever we see information of that sort, it always comes from a mind, not a material process. Software requires a programmer, written text requires a writer. And this is why I think it's worth giving time and credence to the potential of an intentional designing being behind the complex information at the very foundation of life. The question of life's origins can't just be a scientific endeavor. It raises spiritual questions too. Because as we search the cosmos for the answers we all long to know, the questions of how through the scientific process inevitably gives rise to the question of why. Why? Now that is a question I can't answer. 
I think the question of why says that we have a purpose or something. I don't think we do. So I think the why doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, I think we were created to love our creator and the creator loves us. Um, and that's the sort of reason we're all here, I guess. Yeah. Because maybe the God wanted to. <laughs> I don't know. Oh gosh, probably an accident. If you believe in a, a creator, then the only need a creator would have is not even a need, but is, is a that the created creatures reflect that perfect uh, creator. And that's, I guess you could call that praise, you could call that um, a full humanity. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that very difficult question, but I do think life has a purpose. I thought, I thought the questions were going to be, where's the nearest cash point? <laughs> if you've enjoyed this journey, don't forget to like, subscribe and share your thoughts in the comments below. We really want to hear what you think. We want to know what you want us to make next. So get typing, get typing now, type. I don't hear the clacking, type, 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 type. Cheers. Cheers.